Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Van Ostrand, and on behalf of ACE RL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Insights on the Modern Library, How the Online Generation is Transforming Libraries, sponsored by ProQuest and featuring Michelle Dakota, Catherine Silberger, and James Hammond. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship. Before we get started, I'd just like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the left-hand side, you will see a chat panel that you can use to submit questions or comments. We will spend some time responding to your questions during the program, so please feel free to submit these throughout. You will also see a separate box for technical questions. Please feel free to use this feature for any technical difficulties you may be experiencing so our production team can troubleshoot them privately. And finally, please note that today's program will be recorded, and all registrants will receive follow-up instructions on how to access the archived version. Michelle Dakota is Lead Product Manager at ProQuest. In her current role, she is the primary liaison with leading in institutions in developing the next generation library services platform. Michelle brings to the library industry more than 15 years of experience managing cross-functional teams at leading software and hardware technology companies and delivering products worldwide. Michelle holds a U.S. patent and was published in several technical journals and has an upcoming article to be published in the Journal of Library Administration. As a professional development instructor, she coordinates an annual women's retreat and has created and taught courses at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and Las Positas Community College and at local venues in California. James Hammonds joined Ball State University Libraries in 1998, where he is currently head of library technologies. He and his crew mined Intota, Summon, 360 Link, and Myriad Research Databases, the Interlibrary Loan and Library Management Systems, a data warehouse, and some homegrown applications that support library operations. Catherine Silberger is the senior librarian at or for digital content services at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. As part of her digital content duties, she manages the collection and analysis of library statistics. Like all librarians at Marist, she serves as a library liaison to several academic departments. She regularly interacts with faculty in her liaison departments. Catherine has also coordinated the implementation of Intota at Marist. So at this point, we are ready to get started. And I'll hand it over to you, Michelle. Thanks so much. Good afternoon and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Thanks for taking time out of your day to attend our session. My name is Michelle Dakota, and I'm a product manager at ProQuest Workflow Solutions Group. We develop both librarian and student-facing software solutions that serve students, instructors, and librarians throughout the research life cycle. ProQuest offers content on the ProQuest platform, eBrary and EBL, and software solutions such as Summon, 360 Link, RefWorks, and Intota. Recently, we conducted two sets of end-user studies aimed at informing our product development and refreshing our awareness of today's academic student. We framed our study broadly to answer the question, how do students search? And we observed behaviors before students even started to work in software. This study was performed in conjunction with Serena Rosenhan and her user experience team. Our work differs from other studies in that we examined the entire research life cycle. We interviewed students at varying points in their academic journey, and we included faculty and instructor interviews. Additionally, in analyzing the research, we found learnings that could guide both the vendor side, so for us, product development, but also points of interest for librarians. And some of those points we'll share out today. Look for publication of our study online in the Journal of Library Administration, and that article went live just yesterday. It's always exciting to present research along with customers who can give their own view of how they might apply these findings in the library. Uh, we are so pleased to be joined by James Hammond, who will talk about the role of discovery and the online generation, and Catherine Silberger, who will discuss some examples of engaging faculty. We can 
conducted two rounds of contextual studies, a combination of focus groups and in-depth interviews at six academic campuses in the U.S. with the goal of better understanding the research process, context, tools, and behaviors of academic researchers. The primary research questions of the initial study were, how do students approach research tasks for coursework? Which resources do college students choose to start their research? And what are some of the current benefits, pain points, and unmet needs that students experience while they're using the available research tools? In our second study, we added a focus on understanding the full research cycle from topic selection to assignment completion, and we included more direct observation of the use of the research tools. We also interviewed university faculty and instructors. We selected campuses that represented a variety of institutional profiles. So we included a community college, two small private four-year colleges, one medium public four-year university, a private research university, which is also an ARL, and one private Ivy League institution. We selected schools that had a large range of electronic journal and database offerings and also had a range of search and research tools. So we didn't go to just institutions and campuses that used ProQuest products, for example. Uh, we interviewed uh, across a large selection. Between the two studies, we held 18 focus groups and 35 in-depth interviews, and in all, we spoke to, uh, to 125 researchers. This group included every stage of the academic career, from freshmen to tenured faculty, and represented a wide range of academic disciplines, business, health, physical sciences, arts, humanities, the sciences, social and political science, law, and engineering. All sessions were 60 minutes and included a facilitator, an observer, and a note taker. And more details of that study are available in our article that was just published. So some of our findings. At the highest levels, we could generally categorize some student pain points. Those are awareness and knowledge. Students were largely unaware or unfamiliar with accessing the vast majority of resources provided through college or university libraries. Another pain point that we observed was training. Schools varied widely in their approach to library instruction, and students without access to instruction generally struggled much more than those who had some level of orientation to library resources from either a professor or a librarian. Another major pain point was time and efficiency. Time is the primary currency of students, or so they feel. And real or perceived inefficiencies and roadblocks cause students to deem many resources just too costly to use. Students come to college with an expectation of independent, easy, and efficient access to information. With this expectation, um, comes the sense that they can find things quickly. When the expectation of easy and efficient access to information comes against the demands of the academic research task, we observed several behaviors that attempt to satisfy and balance the tension. The most commonly observed behavior is the use of Google in concert with library resources. Both studies found that while Google is widely used across all fields of study and at nearly all points of the academic career, overwhelmingly students ended up in library resources. In fact, our first study suggests that only one in 55 of the students we interviewed seemed to avoid library-provided resources. The literature also suggests that Google is a large driver of traffic to library websites. However, the transition from Google to library resources was often painful, and students were unwilling to pursue resources in the face of barriers, such as paywalls, broken links, or irrelevant search results. We found that the device is part of the uniform. 
Students are used to instant access and immediate gratification. Having grown up in the digital world with quick access to responses that are served up from a Google-like single search box experience, students expect that most information can be found online. We called them armed and dangerous because we found that overwhelmingly students had access to computers and other mobile devices. In general, we found very little socioeconomic differences among schools. And we found that they did not, or, or that socioeconomic differences did not impact the prevalence of mobile device use among students. Nearly every student made regular use of smartphones. Students seem to exhibit a hesitation to ask for help. They approach college with an I can figure it out attitude. And this self-service mentality meant that students tried to figure out solutions for their own research needs independently, possibly with help from peers. And they seem to exhibit a hesitation to speak with librarians. Students often started in Google, but overwhelmingly we found that they ended up in library resources. They are using the library. They're using it differently, and the transition from Google to library resources was often painful. Here's one quote from one of the students that we interviewed. So what are some of the influences on research behavior? We found, overwhelmingly, that faculty instruction was a primary influence on choice of research tool by students. Professors' requirements for assignments, both directly and indirectly, influence the resources a student chooses for search. When instructors demonstrated or directed students to use specific library resources, students were unlikely to seek out alternatives. So the influence of the professor was extremely sticky in our findings. Faculty that we interviewed overwhelmingly seemed to want their students to access and use scholarly resources. They often worked in partnership with the library, and from our observation, held the library and librarians in high esteem. You can read more about our research in the Journal of Library Administration. That online article was published just yesterday. And I'll turn it over now to James Hammond, who will give a librarian perspective on our findings. Well, thank you, Michelle, and thank you, um, everybody in the audience out there. <clears throat> Just a moment here. So um, I'm going to spend some time uh, talking about some ongoing efforts at Ball State uh, to help make discovery work better for students. And you'll see on this slide an, an outline of the um, uh, specific things I'll talk about. Um, in one of the polls that was up on screen um, at the beginning of the presentation, um, I could see that um, upwards of 85% of uh, your libraries offer some kind of uh, single search box experience uh, to students. Um, at Ball State, we actually have two library websites. Uh, one of them is a marketing website, more or less, um, as part of the university's uh, content management system. Um, but we also have uh, the website you see in front of you, which we call the Student Research Resources page. And the idea here is to uh, make the um, experience feel uh, familiar uh, to students who are used to that single search box, while also funneling uh, the students to the uh, most important online services. Um, as you know, sort of shaped by this tab display, which is also probably familiar to a lot of libraries. And so the you know, resources we've uh, um, you know, forefronted here, OneSearch, which is the name we've locally given to uh, the Summon Web Seal Discovery um, Service uh, from ProQuest, CardCat, which is our OPAC, Cersei uh, Dynex system. Um, the, the other, which also offers a single search box um, into um, into that resource, the e-journals uh, tab and the subject guides, which is our LibGuides um, instance, also have a single search box. Uh, the databases, which is really you know sort of your standard list of a couple hundred subscription databases, is more or less a navigable uh, list of databases. Um, so it really didn't merit a search box um, per se. But um, you know we sort of helped shape the. Um, student's user experience using this very familiar interface. Um, also, you know, responding this, to the sort of demand for uh, mobile um, 
compatibility. Um, we have had, um, again, an ongoing effort here, um, starting really with the last time we uh, redesigned our mobile website. Um, on the graphic on the right um, shows you what our mobile website looks has looked like since uh, fall of 2012. Um, the um, re really, it's, it, it might use a refresher at this point. That's that happened to be an interface that was actually pretty popular with, uh, at the time, and uh, it's certainly popular with some um, a lot of mobile apps. Um, the um, we've also uh, done some work with responsive design. Um, um, we've developed um, several custom mobile enabled tools locally, which I'll show you examples of. And uh, we also um, curate uh, a list of mobile friendly research tools with the idea that, you know, essentially we're you know, supporting, um, kind of favoring vendor platforms that serve mobile users well. Um, now, um, kind of as an indicator of how we have been doing uh, serving uh, students demand for you know, a mobile interface to the library. I sort of cherry picked uh, some usage stats. Um, since fall 2012, um, showing usage the first month of school for each year. Now, the reason I, I picked that particular month out is we've got students arriving on campus, and to what extent are they seeking out a mobile library presence? Um, you can sort of see that um, you know fall 2012 2013 we were getting pretty pretty similar numbers of users while the you know numbers of sessions you know which I guess could be a benchmark for repeat visits uh, but then we had a big jump in fall of 2014 now a couple a couple ways I interpret that first of all um, we are just sort of seeing an increase in that expectation that the library will provide a mobile presence. Um, secondly, um, and uh, really not coincidentally, uh, during 2014, uh, the Ball State campus launched a uh, mobile app um, for a gamut of student services, and they invited us to um, jump on board with that. And basically, what our our presence on the university mobile app is a link to our our mobile website, and so we saw saw definitely an increase in visits. Um, which we could attribute to being part of that campus effort. So a, a lesson I draw from this is um, it was definitely a good thing to go ahead and build this. Um, and one other thing I'll point out, this, this is really the third or fourth iteration of our mobile website. Um, we had um, a couple previous iterations that frankly weren't as well maintained. Um, and the user experience, I don't think, was nearly as good as what we currently have. And we also had a Boopsie library app. Uh, the Boopsie app was up for about a year and a half, and frankly, it never really took off. The 500 users you saw for we saw the first month of fall 2012 semester was actually more than we ever saw it in any given month on the Boopsie app. Um, so it is, it is uh, at least to some extent, responding to a uh, user's need for a mobile a mobile interface. Um, here I'd like to show you just a, some sample of uh, work we've done on local mobile projects and also um, implementing uh, the responsive design model for some things. The graphic on the left is actually our Circe Dynex Symphony OPAC, um, where we've uh, made local customizations to make it uh, to make it responsive. Now, responsive design, if uh, that's if that's a new term for you, basically that. Um, uh, enables you to build a website using the same code, regardless of what type of device somebody is using, but also makes the um, uh, layout of the content uh, responsive to the uh, size of the, of the screen that a user is using. So uh, these are screenshots from my own um, you know, Motorola smartphone um, showing uh, what that interface looks like uh, through mobile, and I have to say that even as an end user of our of our OPAC, I actually prefer this uh, mobile interface to our uh, full screen uh, design. Um, the uh, graphic in the middle is a project. Uh, it's it's one of our sort of local mobile enabled um, services, kind of mobile geared services, uh, which we call our stack locator. What happens uh, here is a, a user in the OPAC when they're looking at, a, at an item holding record, we'll see a link um, showing them, uh, um, uh, or a link which leads them to a map 
like the one you see here, showing them the uh, which wing of the library building, which floor, and uh, um, didn't manage to capture it here. But there's a uh, there there's normally yellow highlighting to show them which range uh, the uh, the item they're looking for is located at. And then on the right side, um, obviously. Um, but another service uh, that that's showing a list of uh, text messages uh, where I texted myself some call numbers. Also, a service which is launched from an item holding display in our OPAC, and um, then um, also shows the uh, you know the wing and range information. And that wing and range information, I'll just say, is sort of part of the secret sauce that underlines uh, that um, underlies uh, these services. We do not store that information in our ILS. Uh, there's a separate database um, that uh, stores that information and pulls it up on demand when when a user goes to uh, that service. Um, next slide. This is not necessarily uh, mobile related per se, although it dovetails with uh, um, mobile uh, services. Um, just a couple of screenshots here. The uh, one in the upper left uh, is just a, a sample item holding record for a uh, a local print item in Summon. And um, the um, thing I'm illustrating here, which I've highlighted in yellow, is uh, of the um, uh, capability Summon provides to um, inject uh, local customizations into their interface. And this also shows you how what, what the user experiences uh, when they um, or presented the option to either text themselves a call number, that's the little green button you see there, or uh, to uh, uh, locate the item in our in our local physical stacks. So um, we've, we've been able to leverage that, that capability to provide some of our local uh, services. And then the uh, uh, below that, there's a screenshot uh, illustrating the um, current version of ProQuest's uh, 360 link link resolver. And what I'm Showing there basically is how that uh, presents um, uh, what what ProQuest calls a helper toolbar on the right. Um, one of the things that does is lets us brand the um, target resource as a, as a Ball State University Libraries provided resource. And I highlighted the uh, um, the custom link I set up down there to check um, uh, for print availability of an item, which is something we we typically want to do when we don't. Have an electronic entitlement to a particular uh, journal or um, ebook, but um, in this case, I just wanted to show uh, that um, um, one of the things we discovered as we um, updated our link resolver to Link 2.0, while also having Summon available, is uh, we ended up preferring the Summon display of local print holdings over um, our uh, legacy OPAX display. And so um, again, you know, using the um, you know, improvements we see in some of our vendor platforms to uh, try to provide a, a, what we consider, and hopefully what our users consider, a friendlier experience to them. Um, one other thing we do, and this um, kind, of, kind of steps over into um, you know, kind of a, the other side of the equation. Uh, what do we do about problems that come up for users in the uh, discovery, their discovery workflow? Um, Easy proxy um, is um, probably still one of the most commonly used uh, methods for authenticating users to licensed resources uh, from off the campus network. Um, we've been using it for years and years. Um, and one of the things that we um, have customized locally is uh, the interaction uh, users have when they um, hit upon a link that just doesn't work through Easy Proxy, and that could be a couple things that are probably typical cases similar to you all. Um, the resource just may not be properly configured in Easy Proxy, or the or, or the user has uh, come across a link that um, um, is just incorrect. In this case, I, I contrived an example where I just misspelled EBSCO in the URL. And um, this is the kind of message that the user comes up um, with what we hope to be some helpful tips to get past their immediate problem. But the, the, the cooler thing about this, though, is we also customize this to uh, send an email to uh, us in uh, library IT services, um, it, which if we happen to get it uh, you know, during our 8 to 5 hours, uh, we can usually address within a few minutes uh, by fixing the configuration. 
um, in Easy Proxy, or uh, certainly by early the next business day. Um, before we did this, um, there, the, the odds are overwhelming that we would never hear about uh, the, um, uh, the the problem. So this th this way, we can at least sort of improve that as we go along and uh, try to prevent uh, users from stumbling over the same uh, problem over and over again. So um, I'd like to wrap up actually with some more sort of open-ended thoughts. Um, you know, Michelle uh, Michelle's research presents um, some great and, and very informative findings about how co current college students are um, kind of existing in uh, you know the research discovery process. Well, how ready are we for the next generation? Um, and I actually have you know a couple examples, a couple you know anecdotes uh, that in my mind um, at least at least having have me getting ready to get ready, so to speak. Um, Ball State, uh, just to give you one example, ha um, hosts a, um, a high school program called the Indiana Academy, which is um, a, a magnet school for um, high ability juniors and seniors uh, from all around Indiana. Uh, their school year starts several weeks before Ball State's um, uh, regular calendar. And uh, during the very first week of the high school year, um, I happen to be you know, stepped just outside my office and was helping um, a, um, um, you know, had a chance to help a student who had her cell phone in hand uh, with the uh, stack locator displayed. And uh, she, and, and the only help she really needed was, uh, you know, somebody to sort of uh, point to her uh, which direction to go physically to find the uh, uh, range she was looking for, uh, which it turns out she, she caught on to um, even before we got halfway to the uh, stack uh, that, uh, where her item was located, which just you know showed me that we're we are dealing with a younger cohort that um, you know sort of a, as as Michelle pointed out earlier um, is perfectly capable of um, you know self service and um, wanting to uh, you know jump right in and 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 you know use tools that you know help them help themselves. Um, that was a high school junior. Um, my other anecdote is actually my own son, who's currently an eighth grader, um, attending um, school online through uh, one of the um, couple of well-known virtual schools. Um, now, as, a, as a, you know, he just turned 14, and he really is a true digital native. And you know, just to give you an example here, I mean, he was learning the alphabet on computer before he could uh, even form two word sentences and uh, was still entertained by teletubbies so he's been he's been digital all along um, he has absolutely no use for printed textbooks or um, you know, educational materials at all um, possible exception he might print out a worksheet if he has to do a science uh, experiment at home or something like that so he could follow his directions um, or take notes um, on the other hand, he dreads any assignment uh, that has any sort of research component, um, which at the very least shows us that uh, with um, you know a truly digital native um, student um, you know coming up to our undergraduate institutions in the next four or five years, there is still an opportunity for librarians to um, to um, um, you know help uh, these students and help direct and help. Uh, sort of shape their online experience to make it, uh, I guess, less dreadful for them to put it uh, um, to put it bluntly. Um, and with this, um, I think I will um, go ahead and turn it over to Katie for her her uh, presentation on um, her outreach with uh, faculty. Okay, thank you, Jim. That was very interesting. Um, as Jim said, my name is Katie Solberger. And I'm the Senior Librarian for Digital Content Services at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. Um, we're going to be talking about sharing library usage data with faculty. In the traditional library paradigm, content brought patrons into the building. There was a symbiotic relationship between the physical space and the physical content. Historically, the need to access content physically brought students and faculty into the library building. The content and building were inseparable elements of the library. And in that 
paradigm, we all learned about resource usage visually. Librarians, faculty, students, we all looked around and saw how information was being used. You could observe worn book bindings. You could see patrons using indexes and abstracts, or sitting at tables and reading library books, or interacting with librarians at the reference desk. You could see reshelving trucks of books waiting to be returned to the stacks. Everyone coming into the library had a sense of how the library was being used. The library building was also the common ground for librarian faculty exchange of information and ideas. The faculty may have come to use the content, but during those visits, there were often informal and very informative interactions between faculty and librarians. And it went both ways. You know, librarians learned from the faculty. Faculty heard about new resources from librarians. In today's library, the content and physical space have been disaggregated. The old paradigm no longer applies, and a new paradigm is evolving. Students still do come into the library. In fact, we are seeing greater library occupancy year after year. But generally, the students are not coming specifically to use the collection. They are looking for a quiet place to study, free of electronic distractions. They're looking for collaborative library study space. They may come into the library. They may choose to come into the library to do their research. But they're not obliged to come to the building to access the library content. And in fact, for many of our learners, the distance learner, the library is simply too geographically distant. So faculty and students use the electronic library from their offices, their dorm rooms, from home while studying abroad. They use it anywhere and anytime they find it convenient. And overall, that is a tremendous improvement in information access in the service that we are offering to our patrons. But it has also brought about a significant change in patron librarian interaction. Outreach to patrons is now an important activity for libraries. Um, other aspects of outreach involve written and interpersonal communication, which I will now discuss. So what are faculty visually observing about college student use of information today. They see students using mainly tablets and smartphones. Students may search Google for information during class. And certainly, Michelle's research indicated that Google is a, and other search engines are a very important part of a college student's information um, seeking uh, habits. As soon as the bell rings, students may pull out their smartphones. So that is a part of the picture that faculty have of their students' information habits. What do they hear and read about their students' information habits? They see discussions about their students in social media. They see, for example, articles with titles such as The Role of Social Media in Higher Education Classes, a Literature Review or social media and quality enhancement in higher education, or systemic approach to learning paradigms and the use of social media in higher education. You get the idea. That is another part of the picture that faculty have of their students' information habits. But there is yet another important part to the full picture of student information habits, and that is that students use the library. We need to share information about library usage so that faculty have a more complete view of student information habits. We need to fill in the picture with concrete information about how our students are making use of library resources and services. And data helps us to do this. It helps us demonstrate that we are not engaging in wishful thinking, but rather we can quantify a level of usage that may surprise some people, and we can demonstrate the effectiveness 
of library services. Students do use the library. We need to spread the word. So how do we know what resources are being used? As we moved into the electronic age of libraries, we librarians first needed to know that we were spending our money effectively. Initially, the electronic database and document usage data was collected and analyzed mainly for collection development purposes. But data collection and analysis now extend beyond just electronic document usage. Many areas of the library are now becoming data-driven. New services that have developed to serve the electronic library now have a reporting function as a standard component. For example, we are a LibGuides customer. They provide us with page view and link click data, as well as when the pages were accessed. We use those reports to gain insights not only into the effectiveness of the guide itself, but also about the effectiveness of our presentations to classes. When you see a spike in guide usage right after giving an in-class presentation, then it seems that communication was effective. Many libraries, ours included, have some homegrown statistical logs as well. We keep track of reference questions, LibGuide creation, and bibliographic instruction using Google Spreadsheets. Google Analytics provides libraries with further information about their services. For example, we are interested in knowing such things as popular browsers and operating systems, types of mobile devices, and the percentage of traffic originating on campus. The mobile device use of library resources may be particularly interesting to faculty. They may not think of the library as being mobile friendly. But since they observe their students using mobile devices, it is important to let them know that the library is mobile friendly and that some students are, in fact, using the library from tablets and smartphones. We have come to realize that the diverse streams of usage data are of interest to the greater college community. Certainly administrators are interested in this data, but the faculty members who are no longer able to observe the traditional signs of library use, who no longer chat with a librarian during a visit, those faculty members actually find information about library use patterns to be quite interesting. In today's electronic library, usage information comes in the form of spreadsheets and statistical reports. It is up to us, the librarians, to distill out the essential interesting information about patron usage, and to generate short and highly relevant reports to share with faculty. There is a lot of competition for their attention, so short and highly relevant is important. In other words, it is up to the library to share insights into how the library continues to serve college student information needs. As Michelle said in her presentation, Instructors are primary influencers on how students use library resources. In other words, faculty have a sticky influence on student information habits. If they are directing them to resources outside of the library, then that is what students will use. If faculty direct students to library services and resources, then students will use the library. In other words, faculty drive student use of the library. The greater their awareness and understanding of library use, the better they are able to direct students to the most helpful resources. How do we communicate with faculty? Some of that communication will be directed at the faculty as a whole. Um, like many um, of the uh, librarians out there, uh, we have um, a newsletter that we issue twice a year. And we will include some information about overall library usage in each issue. In this example, we shared information demonstrating the effectiveness of the library program supporting the first year seminars. We integrated very select data derived from LibGuides and local campus resources into the narrative. The article was short and to the point, and we received some positive reactions from faculty to the article. 
periodically we are fortunate enough to be divided, invited to a department meeting. Time is of the essence at those meetings. So I may share with faculty a handout on a single sheet of paper listing the top 20 journals most heavily used in their field. On one side, the information is sorted alphabetically. On the other, it is in descending order of use. I pull this information from the Intoda Assessment eJournal by Hilk report and then refine it further in Excel. Faculty find this sort of information interesting. It is a great conversation starter. I also share information about the department's subject guide. We have a subject guide page for each major offered at the college. We report on the most popular pages within the guide, the most frequently clicked links, and we also talk a little bit about what isn't getting used. And this can open an interesting conversation and exchange of ideas. Upon request, we will work with a faculty member to create a course pathfinder. And this is an example of where the communication is not with the faculty as a group, but it is one-on-one -on -one communication. Um, we have been creating these course pathfinders with LibGuides for three years now, and the repeat business is great. Most of the pathfinders we create will be reused multiple times. Um, we find that faculty will come and ask for pathfinders for other classes once they have used one. Part of this librarian-faculty working relationship involves sharing data from the LibGuide report. We don't share any information until the semester is over and grades are in. We don't want to, however subconsciously, you know, have an influence on the grading process. So once grades have been turned in, we communicate with the faculty member, letting him or her know that the Pathfinder is being set to unpublished, but will be available upon request in future semesters. And at the same time, we share the usage timeline, page use, and link use information. Frequently, after seeing the data, faculty will request changes to the guide. Um, and we let them know we are happy to modify it as often as they want. In this one-on-one -on -one interaction with, family, uh, with faculty, we will be discussing the guide, but oftentimes, the conversation will touch upon other relevant information about the library as well. Like many colleges and universities, we assign a library liaison to every department. The library liaison is the go-to person for everything in the library. Some of the contact is librarian-initiated, and some of it is faculty. Sharing the wealth of usage data with our fellow librarians, providing them and providing them with access to the data and awareness of trends is essential. We maintain an internal private blog for our librarians through which we share information. We can post reports there, et cetera. For example, I regularly post the top 50 summon searches of the past week. We share information about heavily used journals and databases, the geographic location of our users to give a sense of what's happening with distance populations. And we summarize trends of library services. Some of the most valuable interactions with faculty are unexpected. Um, the liaison, having the liaison well informed helps whenever they interact with faculty because these are wonderful opportunities to talk about library resources, services, and trends. So sharing this data with librarians is essential so that they can be most effective in the unplanned meeting. So we have just prevent, presented a few ways in which the library can engage with students and faculty, um, both through software and through um, direct contact. Um, faculty um, communication is happening in libraries all over the country. And uh, we hope you found this presentation of interest. Thank you. Thanks so much to James Hammonds of Ball State University and Catherine Silberger of Marist College. I'd like to invite you to chat in your questions. We've got time for questions and just fantastic uh, to hear from librarians. So this is a great opportunity for information exchange. Go ahead and chat in some questions. We do have one uh, question here all queued up. This question is uh, from San Antonio. 
Students will search Google on their phones, but do they search library databases, business data sources, e-journals? Um, they don't seem to do it at this particular institution. And so I'll ask that question first of uh, James Hammonds, and then I have an anecdote to, to add to that. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, sure. Well, my, my, naturally, my ability to answer the question is limited by the data I have available uh, in terms of usage. But fortunately, we do have um, Google Analytics tracking usage of um, a couple of uh, resources that uh, fall in line with this question. Um, you know, looking at Summit, which uh, is our web scale dis discovery um, service, um, I'm seeing that for the for the previous 30 days um, this uh, fall, um, about five and a half percent of all sessions in Summit are being done from mobile devices. Um, that breaks down to uh, 3.5% using handheld mobile devices and 2% um, using tablets. So um, that's sort of mid-single digit um, usage. Um, that's pretty typical, I think, for a, a for, yeah, compared to what we've seen over, over several years. But I think it does show um, um, some um, significant ongoing demand. Um, what I do see, though, is that engagement tends to be um, a bit more um, sustained on a desktop device, which um, would also include a laptop. Um, users seem to be spending about four minutes when they're in summon when they're using their mobile device and twice that long when they're using a desktop device. Um, I looked at one other resource, uh, CardCat, which is uh, the name for our OPAC. And uh, this actually surprised me. Um, it looks like 10 and a quarter percent of sessions in the OPAC are being uh, done from mobile devices. And of that, the breakdown is 8% handheld and 2.25% uh, tablet. For some reason, tablet usage seems to be declining. Um, I'm not sure why that would be if uh, the tablet is just sort of falling out of favor with the age group that's coming up, I wonder. Maybe, maybe bad news for the tablet makers. But, uh, but mobile device uh, usage is actually increasing compared to uh, last year. It's up 13%, whereas overall usage of the OPAC um, is declining. It's, it's declined 3.5%. So, um, so students are um, sort of increasing their use of a mobile device to search the, um, to search the catalog, and really to search both, both of those resources, even if, uh, even if the overall percentages are still fairly modest. Fantastic. Thanks, Jim. I have an anecdote to add to that. So um, in one, one conversation with a student, I heard of a case of an institution on the East Coast who, upon finding that medical students were using Google on their mobile phones, conducted a workshop. This was a library that conducted the workshop on research and got students set up to use library resources from their mobile phones. Um, so that's my anecdote. Go ahead and chat in questions. We're just fielding a couple here. We had a question around percentages. Um, I would have to consult our summary for me to give percentages of students using tablets as opposed to smartphones and laptops from our studies findings. I don't have those numbers handy. I think Jim just gave uh, some information from Ball State. And then we had some questions on the article. So as far as I understand, this article is published um, as an open access article in the Journal of Library Administration. It just went out yesterday, and it's how students research implications for the library and faculty. If you have trouble accessing that article, I'll post my uh, email address um, in the chat, and we can figure it out if I can get you a, um, an open access, uh, easy to find link. I would be happy to do so. So I'll post my email address in the chat just shortly. Um, and then we've got some questions around the decreasing number of tablet users as related to the increasing size and ability of smartphones. Um, I don't know, Jim, do you have any, any anecdotal insights around uh, the changeover that some folks seem to be observing in the number of tablet users as opposed to the number of phone users? Yeah, not really. I, have, I I really haven't been involved in any direct um, inquiry into that. 
Okay, fantastic. We've got a question for Katie. Um, Katie, could you talk a little bit about how you uh, were able to extract the top 20 journals by academic field? Ah, uh, yes. Um, we are using um, Intoda assessment, and there are a lot of reports in there. But one of them will give you journal usage by ILK, which is, um, oh, I, I'm not sure I can get the whole name of it out, but it's, it's a subject listing scheme for, um, uh, for journals. So we will start out with the language and literature ILK category. And I customize it a little bit knowing what the interests are at our institution. But um, basically, I use that, and then I just pick out the top 20 um, most heavily used journals. And it's a, it's a simple little thing, but um, it, it's surprising how people like to see that information. Fantastic. So did that answer the question? We'll just check to see if we got, I, th I think that answered the question. I'm going to check the chat to see if there's any further follow-up on that. Um, and again, if you had questions on that and you did not um, get that answered clearly, feel free to email me or to reach out to Catherine, and we'd be happy to talk to you about it offline. I am not seeing any other questions. We've got a good number of questions here around uh, tablet versus um, laptop and the definition therein, and I, I'm not available. I, I, I can't speak to that um, specifically. Uh, we've got one other question for Katie. Is it possible for any of us to see some of the faculty course libguides? I think we've got some folks who are interested in how you've got those set up. OK. Well, what they are is they're libguides that we have developed with, with faculty. So if you go to the Marist um, Library website, um, we have things categorized by either course pathfinders or subject guides. So the subject guides are ones that we have put together to serve a department. But the course pathfinders, when you click on the link for course pathfinders, what you will see is the they all begin with the um, registrar's designation for the course. So we divide them up um, according to department, and then students locate them by the registrar's um, designation. So they are aimed at students, but they are created in collaboration with the faculty. And oftentimes, faculty will also link them into the course management system. And we will do anything that they want us to do. I mean, there's a broad variety of requests that we get. Some people want something that is equivalent to electronic reserve, and that's, that's great. That is helpful. In other cases, they will have described an assignment that students need to work on. And we will link the databases that are going to be most helpful for that assignment so that it, its effect is to focus students' attentions on the databases that are really going to um, work um, for that particular assignment. So yeah, go to our website and, and take a look. And you can email me um, later on if you have any questions. And then we've got a question for James. Is the print item locator you use in Summon part of 360 Link, or is this an in-house customization? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, it is um, an in-house custom application. Um, and um, I can uh, provide my contact information in the chat if uh, people would like to know a lot more detail about that. But it's basically um, uh, built uh, with PHP and MySQL, um, there's also a, an administrative backend where the uh, man our, our library stacks manager um, can um, track where um, you know what, basically what call number ranges are, are on each uh, shelving area, um, and that's really what drives the um, you know location uh, feature of that. Um, and we, as, as I pointed out, we've been able to leverage this for a couple of different functions. There are even others that I won't get into because they're really sort of backroom uh, operations. Uh, but it is um, 
standalone, um, but it is uh, sort of set up to operate um, as part of um, really any user interface we put out there that presents print holdings. Does that, does that answer the question? Yeah, we'll see if we get a follow-up in the chat. Um, just as a quick time note, I think we've got time for just about two more questions. We often uh, take these offline, so we get a printout of the questions, and we can follow up with you afterwards as well. One question um, could be essentially sort of summarized in, there's been a good number of studies that, uh, that really have researched and looked into student research behavior. Uh, now what? And so I think to that, from our view, I think uh, we're investigating some of the faculty behaviors, as an example, you know, really digging into what university professors and instructors are doing in, um, in their day-to-day -day activities around search and research and other tools. Um, so that's another avenue that I think makes a lot of sense to explore. I think it's always great to reach out to the end user. I think the end user, uh, their behavior is changing, and our users are coming from um, from high school and with changing habits. So it's always important to, to touch in on how users are behaving. I would be very interested also in investigating how middle school and high school students are taught to search and research to get a picture of the tools that they use, um, perhaps complementing some of the work of Allison Head and others who have looked at preparedness for uh, college and university level coursework. I think that would be a very interesting uh, place to conduct some research. I've got a question for our panelists. I'm, uh, we've got a question that came in. Each resource and service we offer has its own data that could be leveraged to have conversations with faculty, students, and administration. Have any of you found a good way to aggregate or combine some of the different analytic data to present a holistic picture of that virtual library environment? Wow, that is, that is a really good question. Um, because I think it is daunting that there is there, there are so many data streams that we're dealing with. Um, and one thing I worry about is overloading people with information and not having them, you know, it just it becomes too much to really um, consider. So we oftentimes will pick out um, a trend and and focus on that and perhaps give some evidence of why we think the trend is happening. Um, one thing that we're very pleased to see happen, uh, since we became very involved with the first year seminar experience, um, we're able to document how much interaction we had with those classes. We had a very high level of participation. It was voluntary on the part of the faculty, but I mean, it was just tremendously high. And we have seen reference statistics going up uh, semester after, or year after year. And what's interesting is we're getting much more um, in-house business, people coming up to the reference desk rather than contacting us through, um, you know, an email service or calling us on the phone, which seems to contradict what would otherwise be a trend, that um, this is a generation that uses a lot of email. So when we see something like that that seems to be um, speaking about a change in campus behavior, we would share that. Um, but it is a very, it's a very daunting um, uh, challenge that you have there to combine all these data services. And I don't have a great answer for you. I'm sorry. Okay. Any comments from James on that question? Well, um, I, I, I think it's a great question, and in some ways, kind of outlines uh, my sort of dream job: just uh, being able to figure out how to how to do exactly that. Um, at Ball State, I think, to be honest, we've probably only done this for pieces of the overall virtual environment 
Um, for instance, uh, we've tried to use um, e-journal usage patterns over the years to um, make arguments that we need more resources uh, to, you know, for subscriptions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we um, had had success actually um, demonstrating um, usage of physical library facilities um, to um, um, argue for administration for more resources, at least in some areas for technology in particular. Uh, but um, looking at the holistic picture um, is still um, is still a longer term goal for us. Fantastic. Thanks. We're at time. So we want to thank you all for taking time out of your day to join our webinar. The recording should be available. I've made my email address available if you have further follow-up questions or are having difficulty accessing the recently published article. I can help with that as well. Thanks again for your time and attention. Have a great day.